Welcome to Digital Asset News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and today we're going to go over um, a pretty interesting piece about a meeting with uh, a bunch of big hitters, the CFTC, the Fed chair, and the Treasury, as are really what they're talking about is demanding regulation, which I know this is uh, not what people want to hear, but it has to happen. And uh, they're, what they're talking about here is just how dire we actually need it. So we'll take a look at uh, the report uh, what's going to come about and what potentially uh, could be leading us into the next big market. And then I want to talk to you about there's something brewing, there's something going on because we see this going on with traditional equities, with stocks, with crypto. We're going to take a look at what I call uh, the whale shadows, earnings and CPI. And then I'm going to talk about uh, videos on staking and diversification. So uh, we're going to jump in real quick to what is going on. First of all, welcome. I appreciate everybody stopping by. I uh, do appreciate that very much. And what the report is, is it is from FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. That's quite a mouthful. And uh, it was quite boring. If you want to read it, there's a link in the description. It's a, a nice, healthy 100 to almost 200 plus pages. Have fun with that. Or you can just listen to this video as I summarize everything. And before we get into it, I guess the big question would be, uh, what the heck is FSOC? So FSOC is the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Council is charged with identifying risks to the financial stability of the U.S., promoting market discipline, and responding to emerging risks to the stability of the United States financial system. I find it interesting that uh, these big heavy hitters, uh, of course, they're all involved, just how how they they talk about in the report is how much they want regulation they have to move forward this is a uh, a vast difference between you know 2013 14 2017 when it was like regulation for crypto like eh, it's gonna go away anyhow so don't even deal with it and now here we are with the council that's composed of uh treasury secretary janet yellen federal reserve board chairman jerome powell Acting Comptroller of the Currency, or the OCC, uh, Michael Su, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Director, Rohit Chopra, Security and Exchange Commission, Chief Gary Gensler, fan of the show, uh, CFTC Chair Rostin Benham, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Acting Chair Martin Gruenberg, and National Credit Union Administrator Chair Todd Harper, and a handful of others. And that's everybody just sitting around going, what are we going to do with crypto? I think I just found it amazing. And uh, this is what the report said. It was a great summary by Coindesk. Thank you, Coindesk, for uh, making this uh, palatable, that is for sure. But uh, this is the report, and of course, for what is going on. So uh, that's what it says. Calling on Congress to define the line between a security and a non-security. I think, I know people talk about regulation, how we don't need it, and it's stupid, and we, we don't, we're, we're here to govern ourselves, and libertarianism, I got to tell you. I think for the individual, yes, sure. Maybe there's not much regulation that's needed, although I think we still do. Uh, I think it really comes down to the big institutions. And like we talked about yesterday, institutions are here. Institutions are coming. You can see the reports from, from Coinbase and Kraken and Binance and, and a lot of big, big exchanges they put out. And it, it'll show you just how much uh, the institutions are actually already here and they are buying and they're doing a lot of things. You, and it's in the reports. We've covered this multiple times. Uh, but it's not as much as they should be because they don't have clarity. And this is what all these agencies want. Like Congress, you got to do something. You were put in there to actually write these bills, to pass these laws, and you can't do anything. And we'll talk about a bill that's, that's out that I think could, could alleviate all this stuff. So FSOC said it believes federal agencies already have much of the authority they need to oversee large chunks of the crypto sector, sector the one area I really asked for Congress to get involved is defining just where the limits of securities regulation should be. And again, I found it fascinating that you've got Jerome Powell and you've got Gary Gensler and you got Janet Yellen and uh, the CFTC acting chair just sitting around going, okay, who's going to take this? Who's going to, who's going to take this? Cause you know, if we let it, let it run, Gary's like, I'll take everything and everything's a security, but it doesn't work like that. It's called democracy. Why it matters. The line is between a crypto security and a crypto commodity. What is it? Where exactly does the SEC's authority end and the CFTC's authority begin? And you've already seen them actually talking to each other saying, okay, maybe you can take this, maybe you can take that. And they go from there, but it's going to take some time. 
The report took aim at how a lot of the companies that offer services in the crypto ecosystem advertise themselves as regulated. Uh, not too long ago, uh, there, was an, there was an organization that was saying that uh, your cash is FDIC insured. Well, not really. And uh, it, it was through a third party. And of course, that was held in that third party and it all came about. They need clarity. And I think that's a good idea of why we should have that. FSOC is concerned about money transmitter frameworks that don't have a huge focus on anti-money laundering controls, I suppose. I will say this, it's not like the banks are scot-free. Uh, we've seen them Credit Suisse and some other ones that have been busted already for money laundering issues. But that's, that's uh, just outside of the realm of this, this video. In particular, Port says there are issues with the spot market for crypto. Namely, there is no federal spot market regulator or framework. I think that would be great if we would like to get uh, a Bitcoin ETF and they can regulate the spot market. That would alleviate the concerns of what Gary Gensler is saying. So there's too much, too much manipulation. Sure. In short, financial stability is the key concern. Uh, they talk about how there's a problem with hacks and crashes. A fairly significant section of the report is focused on the fact that much of crypto is built around speculative trading, but is vulnerable to frequent hacks. I don't know how they're going to regulate hacks. I mean, we just saw that um, uh, multiple airports uh, were just hacked yesterday uh, from Russian hackers. Now, whether that remains to be true, if it is the Russian government or hackers who are based in Russia, I have no idea. But I mean, we see stuff like that. We see stuff with the credit agency where they lose all of our private data and is out there uh, throughout the whole web. So if we're going to talk about that, that part, also talk about uh, this other part with crypto. The important part is, re is the recommendations. Regulators should treat crypto risks like they treat other risks, nothing special. The third, fifth, sixth recommendation calls on Congress to get busy. Basically, uh, get your A in gear because you guys aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. Council recommends that Congress pass legislation that provides for explicit rulemaking authority for federal financial regulators over the spot market for crypto assets that are not securities. And we'll, that's the big thing. Tell us, here's the thing. This is very simple. I, I can't make this any more simple than what this is. Tell us the rules of the game so we can bend the rules to our whim. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but that, that is just what it is. It's just like the IRS. They give you clear laws as to what is going to be taxed and what not taxed outside of crypto. I got you. But if you know those rules and you can understand, okay, this is what it is. This is the guidelines. This is where I can move. Then you can move a lot of different ways. And I think that's what the institutions are waiting for. They don't want to, they don't want to stick all their money into a place where there's uh, massive bridge hacks and, and billions of dollars are lost. They have to answer for pe the people who believe in them and also their shareholders. They're not going to get into this, this place where like, hey, an algorithm stablecoin sounds like a good plan and they lose everything. So this is the thing I think that uh, we need. And of course, I know people are going to say this in the comments and you are correct. Where is regulation comes over regulation. I get that. However, just a step in the right direction. We'll fight them off uh, as we see fit uh, moving down the road. But it's easier to, to win a war with a Trojan horse and get on the inside and fight from the inside and just pound on the door on the outside. That's just my thoughts. All right, so to finish this up, before I go off too much on a tangent, the recommendation five called for stablecoin legislation. Other recommendations include closer coordination between different regulators, whether that's state to state or with different types of regulatory entities. I think that would be good actually to, to get all the different states and go, okay, this is, what we should, this is what we should go over. This is a security, this is not a security, this is a commodity and go from there. And having federal regulators continually build out and reassess their crypt. This is a good one. Let me read this again. Uh, other recommendations include having federal regulators continually build out and reassess their crypto knowledge as they oversee and license different entities. <laughs> so I'm going to play this video. I just thought about this. This is, um, let's be honest. Uh, the people that are in Congress and some of the, some of the people that are, are enforcing these rules, they have no idea what they're doing, uh, because it's, it's a new industry and I don't blame them. It's very tough to learn, uh, all the things that are out here, all the jargon, all the, all the different parts. But there was this great video of uh, Sam Bakeman fried I know some people hate him, but just listen. SBF was, he was testifying before Congress and they were getting kind of snippety with him about the different parts. And he just laid it out, laid down the law and said, look, you guys know what you're talking about. Take a listen to this. But I, I actually found something a little bit offensive that was said. I'm going to be pretty blunt. 
the tr most of the traders on our platform know a lot more about these contracts than many of the people in this room, including many of the people in this room who are condescendingly talking to them about what they do and don't know and should and shouldn't be offered. Anyway, I just had to get off that, that off my chest a, a little bit. And I think it's to some points about consumer choice here. I'm not saying that should be a sort of like be all and end all, but I think there is something to be said for it. And I, I, I think that that there's some irony um, in, 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 you know, some of, of the statements made by people attempting to protect those who know massively more than they do um, about the topic and who understand these products extremely well. Um, most of our users do. <laughs> so yeah, just pretty much laying the law down. So when it says here, having federal regulators continually build on and reassess their crypto knowledge as they oversee and license different entities, when are they going to do that? How are they going to enforce that to their own regulators? Like they have to take a weekly test or something? I, I don't know. I just find it... <laughs> fascinating that's what they called for but it's it's a step in the right direction i'm not making fun of them i'm just saying it's just interesting how they put it out i wonder how that's going to do also there's a call for a coordinated government-wide approach to data and to the analysis monitoring supervision and regulation of crypto asset activities look i don't know if they're living under a rock but if you want to find anything that's super easy uh that's what the blockchain's for every transaction everything that's that has transpired between wallets is all out there in the public so um, if you're trying to, to money launder or do those things, crypto is the worst place to do it. Uh, the best place to do it is just use cash. Trust me. I, 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 let me say that again. Don't trust me about that one. I've never laundered cash. But I'm just saying, if you want to hide some things, cash is a great way to do it. And also dirty banks. So then to finish this up, uh, there was a report also on Monday with the New York Fed, which published a research paper that said it was uh, suppo supposedly safe stable coins like USDC might pose a risk to the broader financial sector if it becomes a safe haven for people fleeing less safe stable coins backed by sketchy assets. And I don't understand where they're going there with this. Uh, USDC, um, the CEO, Lair, went and testified before Congress and go, look, I know you guys want everything backed by uh, assets and dollars and things like that. Here's all our paperwork. Here's what we're backed by. We are liquid. We have everything backed one-to-one -one so you can alleviate your fears. So I don't understand where they're coming for with this unless they're like, hey, this is bad news for us. But you know what's great? CBDC. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section. And to finish this up, there is an, a law, or sorry, excuse me, a bill that is trying to make its way through Congress. And it's the uh, uh, Senator Lummis and Gillibrand which is bipartisanship. Uh, one's, a Senate, or one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. I like to see that. As they work together, and uh, this was came, they came on June 7th. And everything we just talked about, it kind of uh, addresses it here. Addresses the CFTC and the SEC jurisdiction. What's a security? What's a commodity? Stablecoin regulation, like we just talked about. Banking, tax treatments, and interagency coordination. The same thing we were just talking about. So I'm like, they want this to happen. You know, the, F, the FSOC wants this to happen. Some of us want this to happen in crypto, myself included. And senators want this to happen. So let's just get this done and then move, move about. So I think this is a step in the right direction. Again, it's amazing how things have moved in 2017. Pretty much the governments and agencies are just like, don't even try to regulate it because it's going to go away anyhow. And now here we are. So let me just think about that in the comments section. Let's move on to, and this is just going to go pretty quick after this. There's something brewing. There's something going on. There's a, um, let me blow this up. There's a website I'm always talking about, look into bitcoin.com. It's 100% free. You don't have to pay anything. Great, great stuff. All about Bitcoin. And one of these is whale shadows. And what the heck is that? Whale shadows. This shows when Bitcoins that have not been moved on chain for many years finally move again. And I have to stress this. They're just moving Bitcoin. Not that they're moving it and selling it. It's just moving. You can't see when it's actually sold. But you can see, uh, you know, like net flows, inflows and outflows for exchanges. Usually if they go to exchanges, usually means they're, they're selling. But that's not what's happening here. I just found it fascinating that uh, in the orange is Bitcoin that hasn't used, moved in 10 plus years. And this purple is seven to nine years. Let me blow this up. There's a couple of things to note here. First of all, in September, you had, 
And this is over a thousand. This is Bitcoin, a thousand, ten thousand, a thousand, almost ten thousand in September moved by holders, holders who have had Bitcoin for seven to nine years. Happened again here September 4th. What's this one? Oh, August 29th, excuse me. And then ones that haven't moved in 10 plus years. This is almost about 500 or so. Eh, a couple here, a couple here. And then it just stopped. Well, because we're not, <laughs> we're not the January 2023, genius. Yeah, it's the November 22. So we're, we've stopped for a bit. But one thing I want you to notice is this. You know that whole thing about diamond hands and never move and or not ne never sell whatever else just from just i want you to burn this into your head for a second and that's when there's peaks there's a lot of movement there's a lot of movement of of uh of bitcoin whales or bitcoin people haven't haven't moved theirs for quite some time when there's peaks so just remember when people say diamond hands forever they're like i don't know if that's true because it seems like when there's peaks People are selling. And then also, uh, whale number three, which now has a new wallet uh, since June. I just want you to notice one other thing is that whale number three just sold a thousand Bitcoin. And they've been, a, and they've been sporadically, um, scantily accumulating. Actually, this is an accumulation since September 22nd. They just have been on hold, like a holding pattern. Like, we don't know what's going on here. 0 0.01 Bitcoin is not anything for a whale that buys 478 Bitcoin, 1,100 Bitcoin in August and June and July. But I find it interesting that they haven't been accumulating. They just sold six days ago, a big chunk of it. And remember, this is the week for earnings report for traditional equities, stocks. And also, the big one, the CPI is coming out October 13th, so in two days at 8.30 a.m. And it just seems like, and you can also take a look. I don't know what the market's doing. I'm assuming it's down. Correct me in the comment section. But uh, these are the things that I think some people know a little bit behind the scenes than what I do. And uh, that's what's going on. So let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then uh, real quick, I wanted to do some more videos, some like how to's on staking. I know there's a lot of people who just got in 2021 and they think, ah, oh, you know, just, just buy and hold, which is fine or, bu or buy and sell, whatever you want to do. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, but I think there's a gap of knowledge about staking. I know, I know some of you do it, some of you like it. Uh, but we were doing a video yesterday and there's a website DCA CC. And I showed just, you know, just a hundred dollars per week investing into Cardano. And we use Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano as, as for the example, and also Sandbox. And in four years, I mean, you could have done some pretty big damage here. I mean, positive damage. If you would have sold the top, you know, the investment would have been 18,400, which is a good chunk of money. But you, if you would have sold, you would have had a value of 651,000. So, I mean, DCA, it does work. It just depends on you know, what you want to do, what's best for you, and what products you really want to get into. And someone made a good point. They said, yeah, Rob, but that's also without you even staking anything. I was like, hmm, that's a good point. I forgot about that. So like for Ethereum, first of all, I don't stake Ethereum. I'm not going to have my Ethereum locked up that long. I'm not a big fan of slashing. So I'm not going to talk about that. But the Solana, Cardano, Binance Chain, Avalanche, Polkadot, Polygon, Cosmos, I do want to talk about Tron, not really. I don't have Tron, but I have Near. And you can see here the rewards for staking. Like Ethereum is 4.71. Eh, all right. Solana is 5%. Okay. Cardano is 3. Point, I think it's the, the industry average is between 4 and 6%. I know our stake pool gets above 4%. So I don't know why it's 3.5, but whatever. Binance Chain, that's kind of weak. Avalanche, 8%. Polkadot, 14%. This is annual numbers. Polygon, 5%. And you don't have to do anything. You just got to stake it. 18%. Dang, 18% for Cosmos. That's uh, that's the one I really want to do. And Tron and then Near, I've got staked right now for 10%. And a lot of these, what's cool about that, like with uh, Cardano, like did you know that you don't give up your private keys to stake Cardano? That's why it's like the best experience of all time. And of course, we've got a couple of stake pools. There is a uh, link in the description looks just like this. You can go to our webpage, 
which pretty much lays out how that's done and how to do it. I know people don't like to stake sometimes because they're like, I'm worried about losing all my crypto. Um, and I'm worried about transferring because I don't really transfer too much. I get it. I understand. So just a real quick rule of thumb. When you're transferring any crypto, just do a test transaction. That's what I always do. I don't care if it's a, um, a wallet I've done many times. I'm like, hey, I'm going to send you something. And, you know, if, if some, I owe somebody a thousand bucks, I'm like, hey, I'm going to send you $20 first. Make sure you get it. And then I'll send the rest. Every single time I've done that. And uh, with staking, it's the same thing. So don't worry about losing stuff. And then of course, with Cardano, you don't have to do that stuff. And then also, um, I like to stake within Ledger because you keep it safe and you keep your private keys and all that stuff. And I'll go through Solana. I'll go through Cosmos. I'll go through, well, we've already done Avalanche, which is a pretty good one. But Polkadot, we need to do, you can also do Polkadot through Ledger. So if that's something that interests you, perhaps, let me know in the comments and I'll rip out those, those videos because I always have to remind myself that, hey, there's people that are new and they need to know these things. And even people, even if you've been around for quite some time, I think this is a good refresher. Also, how to back up your, your seed phrases. Also, how to check your, your seed phrases in your ledger to make sure it's, it's still accurate and still works. I know people want that peace of mind, so I can do that. And that's uh, what's going on. And then lastly, I know that the market sucks. I get it. But when we're talking about these things, remember, I'm talking about these things as far as like a diversification strategy. So 15% roughly is what I try to stake because the crypto is not doing anything. I'm just holding on to it. Might as well make some money off it. Then of course, they have the IRA. I've got cash and stables. I do some DGEN plays. Check out my second channel, DGEN. Dan DGEN, if you want to lose all your money, essentially. That's just a gamble. That's basically gambling. And then of course, uh, my Amazon business and then properties. And then the last one is Masterworks because I own fractionalized shares of artwork. And I think it's a good one. So I want to say thank you for Masterworks for sponsoring the video. I appreciate it. Here's what I've got. I got a Banksy and a Basquiat. Everything I talked to you about, I got skin in the game. I don't know anything about a Basquiat. I know a Banksy. But uh, so far on that Basquiat, I'm up uh, 39, almost 40%. And again, these are fractionalized. I don't own a whole Banksy. I don't have 10, $20 million, but it's fractionalized shares. And guess what? It is registered with the SEC, just so you know. Here's the annualized returns. Not that you're going to get that, but I'm just saying here's what they've done in the past. Here's the performance so far against Russell, NASDAQ, and S&P. And it's even kicking the tar out of crypto as well. Uh, here's over the last 25 years, S&P, real estate, and gold. Here's what it's done again, 21, 33, 27, 33% appreciation annualized. And what was the other one? Oh yeah, link in the description, that type of stuff. So there is that. And I just want to finish off with this one. Hang with me. I had, I had a gentleman on from Masterworks and uh, he's their CIO chief investment officer. And he was talking about something called the sharp ratio. And this is about how to invest as far as like the risk. And I think it's, it's something to note of how Masterworks is doing this. I'm not saying this is for you. I'm just saying this is just an option. I've gotten into this and uh, this is something that you could take a look at if you want to diversify. If you want to diversify, stick it all in whatever you want to. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying this is the information I have. So what, what we were talking about here, Mr. Sokolitsky, and uh, he was talking about the sharp ratio and how they do that. So just take a listen. This is about 50 seconds. Just take a listen, then we'll go in the Q&A. Hold on. And the sharp ratio, what it does is it basically measures an investment's return or how well or how poorly it's done relative to how much risk that investment actually had. You know, it's sort of like a measure of bang for the buck in a lot uh -huh. of ways, right? Okay. So it's it's easy to look at an investment's return, right? Did it go up or down or stay flat or whatever the case may be? But it's a little bit more nuanced and, it, and it's often a lot more informative to use something like a sharp ratio because it tells you, okay, we know how well or how poorly the investment did, but how about how much risk did I need to actually take to get that performance, right? So in other words, maybe you got a really attractive return 
but maybe you also had to take an extraordinary amount of risk to get that return, right? That, that's, that's the type of information you would want to know, how much risk you have to take to potentially get that return that you're getting. So we've introduced the Sharp Ratio uh, for a lot of the, uh, uh, the different artist markets that we track. Uh, and we basically compare it to the Sharp Ratio that the S&P 500 has generated, Okay. Uh, and then we compare it to the S and P. Uh, excuse me, the Sharp Ratio for the overall art market uh, uh, as a whole. I mentioned I come from the traditional world of uh, uh, investment management. You right. know, I can tell you that there are a lot of professional hedge funds all over the world who would love to consistently hire traders whose strategies can generate Sharp Ratios of close to two. Hmm. And yet, believe it or not. There are actually quite a few artist markets that have been generating sharp ratios of close to two. And that's it. So look, thanks for hanging with me on that one. And before I, I we go into the Q&A, just let me stress this. For Masterworks and fractionalized shares of art, that is a very long-term hold. So if you're not thinking years in the future, don't even look at it because it's like a two, three, five type of year play and that's it so look let me just think about that in the comments section i'm sure i'll get kit for that one but that's it so look if you stuck around thanks i appreciate it this was fun times uh leave a uh, like uh, on your way out uh, also consider subscribing and that is it so now if you want to stick around we're going to go over the q a we'll answer all your burning questions the best of my abilities and we will go from there if not adios thank you so much i do appreciate it let's get to it q a Ah, that's my favorite part of the day. All right, all right.